relative abeyance under Trump of the massive U.S. operations on South Korea and Japan to prevent this process from occurring. In other words, this is a process that the Koreans as a whole, both North and South really want, have really wanted for some time, but it's been prevented by the massive pressure that the previous uh, U.S. administrations have been putting on them. The second development is Italy, where it, the Italian government is saying we are very happy to be the only G7 country which has carried, which has carried on so advanced negotiations on the Belt and Road Initiative and will complete an agreement with China by the end of the year to become active uh, participants uh, in the Belt and Road. All of this in the Belt and Road is being uh, blacked out of the Western media. A lot with the Belt and Road is happening with Central America and the Caribbean, which is huge in terms of global shipping and access to U.S. to North and South America in the context of, uh, and it's all being occurring in the context of what's going on with Africa and the Belt and Road. Even the Saudis have agreed, and it's always questionable when you're dealing with the Saudis, have agreed to finance part of China's uh, Pakistan corridor belt uh, development uh, operation. By now, they are pro by now, the Saudis are probably having some issues with the British, with the British uh, overseers over where the winds are blowing. Okay, so now I want to quickly go into the strategic situation, which is unfolding very rapidly. And I think this is very important for people to get this conception in their mind. What has been going on is that as the definite, as the definite midterm election approaches in the U.S., and Trump has opened the door to exposing the system that governs the world through declassification, all manner of provocations are in the works. So this system is now moving in every area of the world to trigger provocations. Uh, the foreign uh, sp uh, spokesperson for the foreign ministry of Russia is saying that the chemical weapons uh, staging is still still in the, in the works. It still could happen. There was yet today or this morning or late yesterday uh, an attack on a military parade in, in southwest Iran. Iran, Iran has summoned the, uh, the United Kingdom, Netherlands, and Denmark. Uh, these are the nations that they consider to be directing and providing safe houses for these terrorists that, that did the attack. Uh, obviously, they are trying to get the Iranians to, to, uh, to, to be provoked. And they're signaling that they're going to be unleashing all these terrorists uh, despite you know, what's going on in Syria. Uh, and of course, unleashing terrorists like this creates all kinds of uh, problems. And all the, essential, the essential purpose of all of this is to find some way to create the excuse for Western and NATO military action before that capability is lost, before they've lost that capability to do this because of, the, uh, because of what might happen in the United States or what might happen under, under um, Trump. Now, keep in mind, Billy Wimmer, who was the, uh, the Deputy Defense Minister during the period of coal, who Helga very uh, much agrees with, he, she, he said the only thing right now standing between nuclear war or not is one individual, Donald Trump. That doesn't mean I'm praising Donald Trump either. Then there was the French and Israeli assault on the downing of the intelligence spy plane, which the Russians say they will finally um, disclose the details of tomorrow, what actually happened, the official details. Then we have the momentous developments between Turkey and Russia. Turkey, which is in, is in NATO and was projected to be the bulwark of the assault on Russia's southern flank through its Turkic uh, ethnic brothers and other fact and their involvement in promoting all these terrorist groups have now agreed to police the demilitarized buffer zone set up between the terrorist forces in Idlib and the Syrian military prepared. prepared. Um, so the now essentially the deal as far as we know is that the Russians have given Erdogan a month to recruit their terrorist assets to into the negotiations and constitutional process uh, instead of getting, having them wiped out. In other words, he's being allowed to to be an influential party 
and, 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 and getting his, his, his hounds under control, which is a good question. I'm sure the British don't want his hounds to come under control, so, so that's a, a, an important uh, aspect of this. Another new provocation emerging is that Poroshenko has announced that Ukraine will be opening up the Azov Sea above Crimea, Crimea to NATO naval forces for stationing. This is really serious. Mm -hmm. This is a huge provocation from Ukraine. The Azov Sea is above uh, the Black Sea. Uh, it, 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 it unfolds it, on one side is Crimea, then Ukraine, and then Russia. And this brings this will bring NATO forces deep into Russian penetration. So this is this is really a big one. So why was the French frigate involved? To draw a Russian attack. Then that became, becomes the excuse to force uh, um, a, a war. All these now you gotta understand, all these provocations are coordinated and centrally deployed through the intelligence nexus that Trump is now threatening to declassify information on, which will ultimately involve revealing, and this is very important, these two words. Methods and procedures, and keep those words in mind, because that's the issue. And these methods and procedure are at the core of policy and power. And I'll go into now what, what I mean by that. There are two fundamental laws that were passed by Congress between 1978 and 19, by the U.S. Congress in 1981. These two laws are, were passed in the U.S. that set up which has since been called the secret government. That's what the people are calling it. The first one is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was set up in 1978. Set up a mechanism of a secret court to get surveillance warrants on domestic and foreign nationals and entities that may be involved in actions damaging to the, to the U.S. A secret court to issue warrants for surveillance, for surveillance. In WikiLeaks, it says that since from 1979 to 2006, there were 22,990 warrants uh, requested. 2, 22, 22,990. Of those, 22,985 were granted. All but five were granted. That's, I didn't find out what happened after 2006, but that's what it was in Wikipedia. 2006, 2009. Was it in Wikipedia? Huh? Was that 2006, 2009? Uh, 1979 to 2006, oh, according, to, okay. according to the source. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in, in 1981, Executive Order 12333 and 12334 were signed. It put the National Security Agency overseeing over, over the issue of national security or something similar involving national security threats. It allowed surveillance of domestic and foreign actors and was integrated with the Justice Department. In other words, it, it, it would, it would um, in the case of domestic, domestic individuals who were involved with foreign actors, they could, uh, they could send the, uh, they, they could uh, have involved the FBI and the Justice Department. Uh, this, this law has been amended three times and made much stronger, and, and, and it's been reorganized so that uh, the, the national, okay, it used to be the CIA was the top, CIA director was top, now it's the national intelligence director, that's the director of national intelligence, DEI, yeah. uh, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> DNI. DNI. Director of National Intelligence. So this whole thing, this, so this whole process over these 40 years, 40, off, almost 40 years, has been has been a consolidation of a, an intelligence community. It is probable that Trump was also targeted by Executive Order 12333, 12334, but we, 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 we don't know that. It was Executive Order 12333 and 12334 that allowed for the Iran for the Contras, the Iran Contra relationship. What? Okay. One of the one of the, the 
the things that these two acts does is it allows the intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies to interface with each other and connect with and use private entities as well and also other national entities far beyond the five eyes. In other words, you have the sharing of intelligence be uh, before that between uh, the five eyes, uh, United States, uh, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, the five eyes shared intelligence. But these are, this is uh, the, the official intelligence of the official government of the United States. But what you've done is you've now dissolved the official intelligence agency to, to a large degree and created a uh, much larger intelligence community that's private, that's public, that's, you know, that's interfaced with the five eyes, but it's also interfaced with whatever. And you saw this in the Iran-Contra thing where, where it interfaced with the Colombian cocaine cartels and, and, and you had one part of the Reagan administration fighting the, the cocaine cartels and you had another part under Bush, Oliver North, that were fighting the, the people that were fighting the, us, the LaRouche people. We're fighting the cocaine cartels, and Noriega was on the side of fighting against the cocaine cartels. But they were able to to use national security to cover all of these operations. Um, and so, in the, in the 40 years since, this has grown into a collective intelligence community. And uh, okay, and it's been much strengthened since then. So how does this become a government that supersedes the elected government? How is this, um, you know, how, how is it that we call this the, uh, the secret government? Okay. First, it is the role of intelligence itself in the formulation and conduct of strategic foreign and domestic policy. In other words, your policies are based on the intelligence that you gather. Okay. And so the big issue is, uh, in the intelligence community is the veracity of the intelligence and how the intelligence is shaped and to what purpose the intelligence is, is, is given. And for that there was a huge fight going on in the, in the intelligence community during this period in which, the, in which many of the intelligence people left over from FDR and, and that represented a certain patriotic element in the United States, they saw in LaRouche an intelligence method that was superior to theirs in figuring out who was lying, who was not. And they, there was discussion of creating an intelligence academy uh, where the LaRouche organization would be training intelligence. Uh, there was some discussion of that at one time, training intelligence personnel. So the question is, uh, uh, the conduct of policy, strategic foreign and domestic policy is shaped by intelligence. One can control the formulation and timely implementation of policy and therefore the operations of government by controlling the content and flow of intelligence operations. And in this way, a secret intelligence apparatus can effectively seize control over the conduct of government. So this, is, uh, this has been going on for quite a while. This, it, there's a warfare, this warfare going on around this. Okay, second, it allows through the, war, through the interface of the intelligence community and law enforcement agencies to weaponize intelligence, to plant, set up, and frame anyone deemed to be a problem to this network, to the secret government. Whether it is LaRouche, Trump, or Lula in Brazil, or Kirchner in Argentina, or, or even Putin. Putin was targeted by this same apparatus in the Litvinenko affair and a whole bunch of other things where they made out, made, where, they, where the power of the intelligence agencies affirmed that he actually committed crimes that he didn't commit. And we see that today in, 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 in the dossier and, and so forth and so on. So, so um, now, how does the second process work? First is the targeted person, uh, the targeted person or group. Uh, it could be a head of government. It could be a head of a powerful political group. It could be somebody who's exposing something, or it could be a leading opponent. First, false accusations are made up justifying surveillance. The subject is profiled in terms of how they, just, how they work, who they know, family, you know, mistresses, whatever. Uh, whatever they have. 
then either some kind of entrapment, sting operation, or whatever. We're actually beginning to see this with this young Greek guy, uh, George uh, Papadopoulos, in, in London. And the planning of, or the planning of false, also the planning of false information and rumors. Then there are leaks and, and, and links to the media. So the media gets involved, and the media is part of this whole process. Stories get planted in which, uh, and so the media is a very key component interface with this intelligence community. Then warrants for searches and other warrants or, or whatever are, are issued. Then the process then proceeds to actions being taken against the individual. It could, and in legal sense, the actions involve uh, a process of finding people that are, that are weak or that are, are compromised to flip them to make uh, false claims uh, for trial uh, against the, uh, it's called flipping, false trial against the, against the target. Okay, this is the system of government and it extends way beyond the boundaries of the United States. I don't think it's just in the United States. It's, it's been extended to the entire transatlantic community, down into Latin America, into Africa, into Asia. Korea was, has been targeted with this. Japan especially has been targeted with this kind of thing. Italy. And that's why everybody's freaked out at the process of declassifying all of these texts and the interviews, the 70 interviews with all these people. And, and um, you know what McCabe and and and, uh, and Comey and Bruce Orr and you know all these people were, were were saying to each other. All of this is not about it's about showing showing revealing a process of government that is going on that is not has nothing to do with who you elect. Or has nothing to do with, with 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 the supposed democratic society that, that you're supposed to be living in. It's not. That's the whole point. And when people start to get a real sense of how they've been governed and why they can't get anything done and why nobody represents them, that's when you have the potential for a real explosion on a mass scale. That has not yet happened. We see the potential in the way Trump has energize a portion of the population, but nothing can compare with this, if this thing goes all the way and it starts to really show how things work. And that is why everybody's freaking out. Because also, this is all legally, these people could all go to prison for this stuff. Because they are conspiring to frame up, uh, uh, to, to get, 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 you know, this, this, is, this is very serious, and a lot of people are worried about going to prison. Uh, Clapper, Brennan, they are now worried. If this thing collapses, they could go to prison. And, and, um, but again, you have to understand, the issue is methods and procedures. That's the primary issue here. Now, uh, I'm going to go through Exhibit A. The war against LaRouche. Now, while LaRouche was involved with a certain element in the, in, the, in, the, in the Reagan administration, another element that had been there before LaRouche began to operate against LaRouche, and what they, against the movement. And they used Executive Order 12333 and Executive Order 12334 to make false allegations that the LaRouche organization was connected to the Soviet Union, that it was being it was being deployed by the Soviet Union. That was the false that was the false uh, connection, the, the false allegation. Then that set up the surveillance process, okay, and it also allowed the FBI to go to the Western European governments with fake intelligence about Lelouch to to Western uh, European because Lelouch was doing a lot with Western European governments, Italy. Uh, uh, France and, and Germany, and to destroy LaRouche's work in Europe. So they would make allegations of things that LaRouche was all about that were, that were false and, 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 and tell, the, tell, tell the relevant uh, 
countries that they should they should have nothing to do with listening to LaRouche. Then it was farmed out to the to the media. In NBC's first camera at the end of uh, 1983, and this is the NBC version of uh, 60 Minutes. It alleged that LaRouche was involved in a plot to kill Jimmy Carter. I didn't hear that one before. Oh no, no, it's right on, it's right there. They said this on TV. That was a, that was a slander. NBC 60 Minutes. No, it was NBC's first camera. Oh, first camera. And the same net and the same networks in in. In 1986, I'm just using this as an example. The same networks in 1986 planted the story that LaRouche was behind the assassination of Olaf Palmer. And there was even, and the Russians, they got the Russians in on it. it it's, it the Soviets got in on it too. They got in on it. There was some kind of deal with the Soviets because the Soviets didn't like LaRouche's SDI program. So they went out, you know, it was, it was a real mess, okay? And I'm telling you that the only reason we know all this stuff is through many, many 30 years of legal fights and freedom of information. So this is the kind of thing that goes on. The same means of procedures are being used against Trump, but Trump is a sitting president. And he is threatening to declassify those things which the LaRouche movement spent 30 years in freedom of information since trying to declassify. That is why the Democrats and Brennan are calling on the bureaucracy to refuse to a lot to 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 uh, resist and cause a constitutional crisis in the United States. I take you back to the Pentagon Papers and the planning behind the Vietnam War, which was in the Pentagon Papers by Daniel Ellsberg. Though the, that the Pentagon Papers were classified, uh, you could it was uh, Mike Gravel, who's a friend of ours now, uh, who as a congressman from Alaska read read the. The, the Pentagon Papers, because a congressman can do this uh, before the House, and it was the threat to do that on the on the 18 on the 28 pages of the 9/11 Commission report and the pressure that came that that certain congressmen were threatening to read it after this massive campaign that we were involved in on the Saudi involvement in 9/11 that forced them to um, to release it at least I don't know how much they redacted. So, so you have to understand, presidents do not declassify anything. To declassify anything is, is unpermissible. Obama campaign was out and during Obama's campaign, first campaign for, uh, in 2008 was asked, would he declassify the 28 pages? He said he would. He did it. Uh, he did or did not? Did not, no. He said he would, but he didn't. Yeah. So, so these executive orders, the Five Eyes, uh, created a global, integrated, interconnected intelligence community in which the British component, currently uh, the titular figure, the senior figure of, of the whole thing, is Richard Gearlock, the former head of MI6, who is the who is the old man of whom all of the networks that 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 collaborated with the uh, with the CIA and the Justice Department are, are, are protégés of his, like, uh, like Christopher Steele. Sorry, Richard. Huh? Dearlove. Dearlove. Richard Dearlove. Dearlove. Okay. So, so, basically, since the British have a much clearer sense of where, of what they want to do in the world, they have a certain um, leverage, they have a certain, they have a certain capability that is superior to all the other components in this thing. But I don't want to just say it's they're running it, because in a way they are, in a way they're not. MI6, MI5, the FBI, it amounts to almost the same. This is a 40-year process of integration and unification. This is not just the British anymore, any more than it is the FBI or the CIA or whatever. It's one operation. It's one thing, and it's all connected to the offshore uh, uh, system, defending the offshore system. It's all about defending the offshore system because that's the system that this is connected to. You know, Comey goes, in, goes out into the board of directors of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. He comes back in, you know, as FBI director. Mueller goes out, 
as FBI director, he takes a job in the financial community as a board of director or something like that. He comes back in. It's all it's all inter interconnected. Is what what uh, um, Robbie was yesterday talking about the uh, the uh, the what was it called the the, uh, the the people of the court and, and arbitration regime. arbitration there. It's all one network. It's all one network. So. Um, <coughs> now, when Mueller came in right after 9-11, get this, Mueller comes in right after 9-11. Rich, uh, Louis Free, who is the FBI director, leaves the FBI right after 9-11. And he goes and becomes the lawyer for the Saudis. And Mueller comes in, and what does he do? He cleans out on more than half of the senior FBI officials and brings in an entirely new crew, which has a different set, a different orientation, a different orientation. And this is also integrated with the media because they set up these relationships with the media where they leak everything. You know, they, this is not, this is illegal to leak, but they, they leak all the time. You know, they, they do it as a, as, a, as a matter of whatever. And lastly, so, so, yeah. And so, you don't laugh and cry. Most importantly, these elements are global and internal to nations, which are which are now being used. This whole apparatus has one intention right now, on a strategic level, to provoke a conflict. Find some way to provoke a conflict. So people like Vladimir Putin, people like Xi Jinping, people like Trump, they have to be on their toes because. At any moment, this thing could anything could blow up on them. They have to be very careful. And then at the same time, uh, you know, people in Russia are wondering, what the hell's wrong with you? Or like they're 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 wondering, oh, why don't you uh, why don't you nationalize your financial system and do all of this and do all of that? He can't. He has to be very careful. He has to be very careful. He cannot allow a provocation. To respond to a provocation that triggers that triggers a, a whole series of processes. Now, of course, if Hillary was in there or whatever, you wouldn't need to have uh, you wouldn't need to have you know it would be different. But uh, so so now all of this could begin to unravel with regards uh, to a process of declassification because I mean it, this whole thing the collusion between between everyone involved, and the British too, the British are part of it. it it's, all, it's all one group, basically. But if you get at the British, you're essentially demonstrating that this thing is not a, has nothing to do with any nation. It, it's an international uh, group. So, uh, so in that context, we come to the situation in the United States. Um, now, all of this, all of this that I'm describing has a cultural basis. It has a financial basis, but it also has a cultural basis of the dictatorship. And it, the way it works is, it's the same principle as the reasons by which ISIS is deployed. Why, is, why are all these terrorists deployed? To, uh, to, to destabilize nations, yes, but what's the purpose of it? What happens? You have a country being torn apart by terrorists. And at a certain point, the people just give up. It's to demoralize people. It's to break them. That's what it's all about. It's to break a nation. Okay. And then, you have all the surveillance, and then they have, everyone is corrupt, so they use that. It's just to demoralize. There's no good in the world. It's all bad, right? There's no, you know, it's just demoralize people. And then you have the identity politics, which has functions in a similar way, though not in a, in a similar way that terrorism does, is that you make a certain part of the population absolutely insane. And that, and their activities and promoting their activities, when there's no, no resistance to that, creates uh, a frustration in the population, an ultimate capitulation to the impossibility of doing anything. So this is how, why, 
Why do they choose identity politics? I mean, what's the, I mean, do most of the people out there really believe in LGBTs and, and, and radical feminism and radical environmentalism and radical, uh, uh, you know, this and that? You know, you know, you have this, you know, uh, whole situation with sex going on. Meanwhile, these women are being raped in the barrio, you know, like every day. But that's okay because that's a different culture. You know, I mean, the whole thing is just insane. But you're driving people insane with this stuff. The younger people especially. And then you have the drug culture and all of that. But the key thing is that most of the population does not, is not like that. They're not for that. It's just that they don't see a resistance. They don't see a resistance because the resistance is, is, is snuffed out before it has a chance to, to develop. However, the resistance did emerge around Donald Trump. People responded to Donald Trump, not because he had the right policies, but because he represented people's sense that they had enough of this crap. They had enough, you know, a, a, a guy contractor tries to get something done and he can't, the environmentalist, it costs him this much to do the environmentalist thing, it costs him this much to do this, he goes to this bureaucrat, this bureaucrat is anti-development, that bureaucrat is anti-development, what's he going to do? What's she or he going to do? And they just get very frustrated, they just get very frustrated, I mean the frustration level for the, not for the big people, not for the big top people, but for the, the average person doing business, it just becomes extremely frustrating and then the business taxes go up, the more regulations, and, and, they, and they're trying to figure out why are they doing this? Don't they want us to have? Don't. So Trump is picking up on all of that, that uh, frustration that's going on in the population. It's just an example. So, uh, so, so there is a backlash going on, but this backlash is not restricted to the United States. It's going on in France. It's going on in Italy. It's going on in Germany. It's going on in Great Britain. It's going on, probably going to be going on in Canada too. Hungary. Huh? Hungary. And Hungary. And all these places, there's a, there's a backlash against all of this. So, so now, what they're trying to do is label that as fascism, label that as whatever, and try to get a, um, try to run, and, uh, run race riots and run confrontations and, you know, run, run left versus right type of stuff going on. But that's not really the core of it. It's just people are fed up with all of this. And in each part of the world, under this global secret government, the resistance to it is taking different forms. It's taking different forms in the United States. It's taking a different form in Italy. It's taking a different form in, in, in Germany. Uh, it's, you know, and unfortunately, Germany is taking more of the form of, you know, well, it is taking the form of anti-immigration. And Great Britain is taking the form of Jeremy Corbyn. And it takes many forms. I'm not, I'm not saying all of it is good, but there is this process going on. What form it will take in Canada in the context of what Phil has described, we shall see. In the U.S., it is shaping up to the midterm elections in, in roughly 45 days. The secret government and its assets the Obama crowd in the streets are going for race wars and identity politics as demonstrated by the latest developments around James Clyburn, who is the number three African-American congressman from South Carolina, who is the number three ranking House Democrat, Maxine Waters and Al Green. They are now saying, they are now, uh, uh, there's a flurry of new legal scholarships saying that, that uh, including Obama's uh, uh, um, t law teacher, Lawrence Tribe, that impeachment is whatever the House decides. In other words, so, and then you see this whole specter of identity politics and uh, uh, around the Kavanaugh case, you know, and y y you see this, and this is, this is, this is drowning out everything else. This is, this is the most important thing that's going on. However, the population is, is, is shifting, and the question, the fundamental question right now is can we get past the midterm elections in the U.S. without a total uh, financial blowout, which is the other thing that's going on. Uh, 
and, and some kind of thing that provokes a, 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 com a military confrontation with Russia. We are on the edge of all of this. This is a very, very um, incredible situation. We're on the edge of all of it. And uh, my sense, personal sense, is that the, 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 the pendulum is swinging towards uh, a rejection of all of the, of the, of the secret government, of, of the identity politics, of all of that. And, that. and that it has to go towards an economic policy. And that's potentially there. We're, we're looking at elevating and starting to elevate the campaign of Keisha Rogers in, uh, in the 9th Congressional District of Texas uh, against Al Green. And we're looking to escalate that and, and energize the, the networks, um, the national networks that are activated. Now, pe people, people don't really have a sense of this. The, the people that are active around, around that are actually active in these Make, uh, Make America Great rallies and are, and are activated around Trump, they're a motley of different, different forces. And they're self-organized, they're organized, but they're not, they're not top-down directed by Trump. They, they, they're not top-down, they're, they're very organic. They, some of them will come out of the, um, the um, Tea Party elements, some of them don't. Some of them were once Bernie Sanders supporters. It's a very motley group of people, but they're, but, they're, but they're active and they're independent. So we're seeking to intersect those layers with the, uh, the, the fight around Keisha, Keisha Rogers in, in, the, in the ninth district. So that's a very important flank that, that we're moving on. So my sense is the pendulum is swing, swinging. At, and, 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 and the more this media just goes absolutely crazy, and, and activates these insane, insane, insane things. And the, and the more the Democrats act insane, the more the population is going to shift. So this also will accelerate the crisis militarily and financially. These all are, are all interconnected. So it, just because I can't, just because I say that the the shift is in the direction of Trump, Donald Trump, doesn't mean that that won't accelerate all the other things that that we're talking about. So. So it's a very, very dangerous situation. It's very frightening, and we have to we have to keep calm and 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 and, and, and move forward and and go through this period and 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 so forth. So that's where I'm going to end. I'll take the ink down for.